Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem and welcome back to today's Daf Hayemi. Avodah Zarah Ayin Hey, we begin on Ayin Dalad Amad Beis. Uh, it's four lines off the bottom. We learned yesterday about a cleansing process uh, applied to non-kosher equipment. For instance, a gas, a wine press, which um, was tainted by non-kosher wine. The process used to cleanse it is called Niguv. Rashi and Mishnah explained. It's a proper a cleansing, proper clean using um, water with some sort of caustic agent. Rashi actually referred to afer ashes, as we're going to see in the Gemara now. And that serves to extract the embedded non-kosher residue within the equipment. So in fact, how? How do we go about doing this? What uh, material is used? What type of detergent? is meant to be employed. What material is used? To do niguv. Rav Amar B'mayim. Simply water. Rav Amar B'chana Amar. No, B'efer. You need efer ashes. Asks the Gemara. Rav who says water. Just water? What kind of cleaning job is that? Rav Amar B'mayim. He meant B'mayim with merely water. B'efer with nothing else? No uh, detergent? And likewise, when Rabba Bar Bar Chana says, Omar Be'efer, use ashes, just plain ashes, how could you uh, do anything with just dry uh, Be'efer without water? Answers the Gemara, no, they both meant water and ashes. Ella. When Rab said, Rab Omar Be'maim, certainly he meant the water has to be initially placed and then followed with ashes. Who had in the Likewise, when Rabbi Barachana said ashes, Omar Be'efer, certainly water has to be accomp- has to accompany as well. There's no difference between the two. They were referring to different circumstances. When Rav spoke about water, he meant water followed by Efer. Because he was speaking about dry equipment. First you have to wet it, and then you can add the detergent, and of course you're gonna, you know, rinse it afterwards to clean it properly. But the starting point is the order is water followed by ashes. Rabbi Barbachan, however, was speaking about retivta, equipment which had, you know, residue in it. Rashi says Yeshba Lachluchis Yain already has some water. It's wet, so the starting point here is to uh, first absorb it. Extract it with the afer, and then you follow with water for the final rinse. Okay, so all agree that uh, you can't clean without water accompanied with some sort of detergent agent. You need the afer, you need the ashes. But in terms of a sequence, it all depends. If it's dry, you have to first wet it, and then put the afer on it, and then rinse it. If it's uh, a wet, you start with the afer. Follow with the mind. Itmar, we have learned by Rav. So the uh, Talmidim in the yeshiva of Rav quoted Rav, Mishmei the Rav Amri. They described the cleansing process as follows. They said, how many steps are involved? Tarti, sometimes only uh, two steps. So if it's, um, it's already wet to begin with, so you do the afer and then the mayim. Tlas, sometimes you need three steps. Let's say it's um, it, it's dry to begin with. You have to start water, and then move on to afer, and then followed with a final rinse of water. So sometimes it's two steps. Sometimes it involves three steps, depending on the circumstance. Shmuel Omar Tlas Arbai. Shmuel, however, holds that sometimes it's three, sometimes it's four. Why? Explains Rashi. According to Shmuel. You need a double dose of afer. So it's going to be afer, rinsed, and then afer again to do a really uh, thorough cleaning. So sometimes it's going to be three uh, steps. So if it starts, uh, starts off wet, you start with the afer to absorb, followed by water, followed by afer. Sometimes it's arboy, four steps. 
If it's dry to begin with, you have to start by wetting it with water. Afer, water and afer. Now, now Rashi points out that although uh, you need a final rinse, you know, at the end to just wash it away, but we're not really, um, you know, mentioning that on the uh, on the list. Well, that's uh, it's just to clean off the, uh, you know, to, to rinse it away. It's not meant as uh, extra part of the extraction process. Besura masnuhach. In the yeshiva of Sura, they uh, they presented the uh, the machlekes the way we just did. That according to Rav, it's one step less than Shmuel. We only need one afer, whereas according to Shmuel, double afer. The Pupadis, however, in the other yeshiva, Masnu, had a different version of this discussion, which turned out to be no machlekes at all. So by Rav Amr Mishmei the Rav, it was quoted from Rav as Tlas Arboy three or four, depending if it's dry or wet. Shmuel Omar Arboy Chamish. It can be four as much as five steps required in this procedure. But really, there's no machlekes. Both Rab and Shmuel, according to this version, require afer to be applied twice. So how could we get to the number four or five according to Shmuel? Well, repeat, there's no machlekes between Rab and Shmuel. Mar kachoshem ma'yav the reason why Shmuel added another step is because he counted the last water as well, the last rinse, he put it into the sequence. That's how he gets to four or five. Umar like Hoshamai Basroy. Rav omitted the last rinse. It's not really part of the koshering process, it's just a more of a uh, you know a hygiene type of uh, step. So uh, he's always uh, one step. Uh, one number less than Shmuel. But in reality, there is no machlekes in terms of what's required to kasha the equipment. Right? So according to Bumadisa, Rav gives us the number 3 or 4. So if it would be wet to begin with, you do afer, mayim, and afer. And we don't mention the last mayim, which is obvious. If the equipment was dry at the time, you have to start with wetting it, moistening it, water, afer, Water afer, and of course we don't mention the last mime. Shmuel takes it up one more number because he adds the last rinse onto his onto his uh, total. Bo minei mi Rabbi Avol. The following question was asked to Rabbi Avol: Hani gurgi or gurni darmai? The darmai means goyim, the equipment used by goyim for non-kosher wine, non-kosher material. And gurgi or gurni explains Rashi: akalim. That's like a a netting. So in the wine press, they would pile the grapes initially to the middle of it, make a little pile, and they would uh, drop the uh, big beam on it for the crush. In order to contain those uh, uh, grapes, lest they get scattered and, and disperse while they're being crushed, you have to sort of keep them in place with this netting. So that's the gurney, some sort of like overturned basket, like a netting to keep it in place. For use for not use for non-kosher, a non-kosher run, my, what's the uh, process uh, required to get it kosher? Amar lehu Rabbi Avo, he responded with a uh, a brayz. Taniso, we learned it in a brayz. Brayz, which actually um, is talking about tuma about the hara issue, so it's not talking about non-kosher, but it's talking about. Equipment which was used for kosher wine, but they were tame. It was uh, being uh, supervised by an ama aretz who's not uh, known to adhere to the halachas of tuma. So we have presumably tame juice uh, uh, material embedded in this equipment. Harisha Yugita obeys bada. He has his wine presses, his olive presses, tame, which are tame and absorbed with that type of material. Ubikesh la soysimetahara. Now he'd like to make a switch. To use them for tahara. How do we cleanse? How do we extract the problematic material from the equipment? So let's go through various uh, uh, pieces of equipment used in a wine press. Hadapin, the boards used to cover the grapes. Vadashin, Rashi says, that's the actual gas that we speak about all the time. This like sort of a piece of equipment which looks like a bath, like a pool. Ubeis badov, sorry, um, valulovin. These are the uh, uh, lulavin. <laughs> These like uh, well, they, used to, they used to make uh, brooms out of lulavin. So it's uh, some sort of uh, a broom. So all these madichan, 
All they require is a, is a good rinse, and uh, and you're good to go. It's interesting that Rashi points out that uh, this seems to be the uh, the final word. You don't need afer in contrast to the previous sugya, which uh, required afer to be added. Just a good rinse, a good power wash is okay. Okay, what else do we have? We have um, va'akalin. Oh, that's the item we're looking for. That's the netting. Shell nitzaren. So it all depends what it's made of. It's made of uh, nitzaren, which are um, these you know, branches. So it's wood material. Or v'shel. V'shel batzputz. Some sort of uh, ca a canvas. It's a type of. Um, it's from the um, linen family. So all these need a, a more thorough cleaning. Menagvan. Oh, here we need to do nigo, which is the uh, water slash ashes treatment uh, uh, plan. Shall shiva, shall gemi. These are more absorbent materials. So if they're made of either shifa or gemi, miyashnon. In this case, you can't just rinse or wash. You have to age them, let them dry up and evaporate. Meyashnon shnemas or chodesh to leave them around for twelve months, so that they uh, totally dry up through and through. Kohen Tanakama, twelve months is required. Rav Shimon Gamliel Oimer, he provides a different number, a different uh, share of time. Manichan megas legas, so you le you leave them idle from this wine press season until the next season, which is. Roughly a year away. By that time, they'll have dried up. We bought labad. In a case of a, a oil press, you leave them until the next uh, season. Well, Hainu Isn't that exactly uh, a twelve months like the uh, first shita? What's the machlekes? Says the Gemara. But now there's a slight difference. Tanakama works with a set twelve month wait period, whereas according to Shimon Gamliel, it's about seasons. Now, sometimes it's 12 months. Sometimes you have churfi. The next year's uh, crop came ready early, so uh, they're up and running only, uh, you know, 10 months down the road. But after the or got delayed, late season. So in that case, you have to wait until the uh, season actually takes place. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a different type of time frame. Chachamim required you to wait until the uh, the next uh, season, irrespective of whether it's 12 months, 10 months, or 12 or, or 14 months. And that's the uh, rule of thumb. So it's roughly a year, but it's not exactly. And uh, it um, sometimes uh, makes it easier, sometimes harder. But the point is, by that time, we assume it's uh, it's been dried up, ready to go. Rabbi Yisrael, her oritzel taron miyad. Suppose he doesn't wait, don't wait twelve months. He needs the equipment right away. Any way to cleanse it right away? Yeah, magilam b'roischen. Dip it into uh, boiling water. Oichotem mezaisen, or pour on them boiling water used uh, to um, cook up the olives. So it's uh, hot water. Uh, that's uh, like hangala, right? And that takes care of any issues. Rabbi Shimon Leil of Mishum He says. Uh, there's another way to solve this uh, instantly. Manichan tachas tzinor, shemeim of mekalchen. Place the equipment under a, a running pipe. Oibe mayon, shemeim of right from a stream with running, gushing water. For how long? Become how long is it left there? Oina. Oina is as a either a day, a twelve-hour period. Kederach shamer biaynes. So the same system. That's applied with respect to kashering this equipment. When there's a yain nesach issue, kach amr b'taharis. Likewise, the same uh, method would apply to make it tahar from tuma. Asks the Gemara, well, well, this brisa just quoted actually speaks about taharis. So if anything, you should be saying it the other way. At this same system, all these methods that were working for Taharis would work the same for Yainessa. Clap your light, which direction are you going? But Taharis coming, we're speaking about Taharis. Ella, rather, the correct way to say it is, Kader Shamr Taharis, the same system employed for Taharis as per this b'risa. 
Kach Amr B'Ayin Nesach would apply to Yain Nesach as well. The same exact formula, same exact system. Now you leave it in the running water for how long? An Oina. How long is an Oina? Kama Oina. Amr B'Chia, Ba'aba, Amr B'Yechnan, Oya, Amr B'Yechnan, either a full day or a night. So it's a 12 hour period. Rav Chana Sheina, that was his name. But Amr Lassam say he was called Rav Chana Bar Sheina. He quotes, Amr Rav Chana Rav Yechnan. No, it's not a day or a night. It's a half, chatziyam and chatziyam, half a day and half a night. So is there any machlokes between this and the previous quote? Of Rabbi Yechanan? Amr Shom Ritzel, there's no machlokes. It depends what part of the year we're standing at. How about Kuvas Nisan and Tishrei? When it's during Nisan and Tishrei, where it's, you know, at the equinox period, so it's even, day and night are even, 12 hours apiece, then you can say either day or night. Habakufas Tamas Vatemis. The second version related to the other parts of the year. Tamas and Tevis, when it's a lopsided proportion. Day can be 16 hours, night can be 8 hours, right? So it's unsafe to say a day or a night. Because it's not reflective of a stand, standard 12 hour period. Rather, in that case, you go with the Chatsi Yom Chatsi Laila formula. So it's 12 to 12, right? 12 p.m. to 12 a.m., or vice versa. And you know, you covered exactly 12 hours. Amar Bida, Hani Ravki. Rashi learns Ravki is the Meshameris, like some sort of sieve used to filter, um, you know, the wine. Dharma of, of the guy used for Yain Nesach. How do you cleanse them? The Mazya, depends what it's made of. The Mazya made of hair, which isn't very absorbent. Madichan, just give them a nice rinse. The Amr made of wool, which is more absorbent. Managwan, you have to do nigo with the ashes. The Kisna made of flax, which is even more absorbent. Miyashin, you have to age it, let it dry for 12 months. Vigo Kitri. Now, if you notice some knots there, surely you have to untie them before you clean it, you clean it in order to get inside and extract everything. Hani de Kuli, These are different types of baskets uh, used for filtering wine. The Armoy of the Gaim. The Chaiti, the the Suri which are knotted and tied with uh, ropes made of tsuri. Rashi says tsuri dekel, palm tree uh, material. Madichan, just give them a nice uh, wash, and they're okay. The tzavsa, made of a, a more absorbent uh, gemi material. Menagwan, that requires nigo. The kisna, made of linen, flax, miyashan. Let it dry for 12 months. And once again, if there are knots, you have to untie them. Vi isbu kitri, sharlu, you have to untie them. Itma, we have learned, amaretz. Who's known not to be careful with Tumma. So whatever he touches is presumed to be Tomei. He came into the wine press and couldn't resist. And he's tapping around. Now the gas is this pit, this uh, pool, full of clumps, clusters of, of grapes with some you know juice sw- swimming around. Now he only touched uh, one or two bunches of grapes. So what happens to the rest? Do we look at it? All as one entity? Or do we differentiate? Well, this is one bunch, this is another cluster, this is another cluster. And only the one that he touched becomes Tami. We have a machlag in Rabbi, Rabbi Chir. Chadamar, one says, Eshkol, Chosim, Vaisav, Tamein. Only the actual cluster that he touched and the, you know, the uh, juice surrounding it is Tamein, presumed to be Tami. But the rest, the other clumps, the other clusters, Vachalagas, Kola, Tahir is okay. Vachadamar, the other one disagrees. He says, Kolagas, Kola, Nami, Tamein. The whole content of this gas is one thing, it's all Tami. Ask the Gemara. Uluman the Omer Eshkol v'Chosiv Vaisav Tmein. The first sheet. Sorry, the second. Uluman the Omer Esh. Right, according to the first opinion, only the Eshkol and its immediate surrounding is Tmein. Eshkol v'Chosiv Vaisav Tmein. V'Chalag Askul Otov. The rest is okay. Why is it different than the a Mishnah we have in Masechas Taharis? In a similar case, a different result. Mishnah Madisnan. Why would this be any different than the Mishnah? You have this um, grinding equipment, this rechaim, this uh, place where they would grind, they would actually take grapes, sorry, great olives. We learned before that they would heat up the olives, boil them, they would boil them to soften them, and then they would put them into this uh, grinder to crush them a bit, and then take them to the uh, oil press to do a final crush. So you have a, a, a grinder full, filled with uh, Olives, and you find a, a sheretz, a dead creature, which is metame amongst the olives. Sheretz shrimps of rechaim, ain't a metame, elamokim agon. 
The only part that becomes tummy is the part that the sherets actually touched. The rest is separate and unaffected. However, vim hayu, haya mashke mahalach. If there is juice swimming around throughout the entire, that's a connector. That's a conductor. I call it tummy. It's all tummy. So why would that be different than our case, where the amaretz touched the cluster of grapes? Since there is you know juice permeating the entire gas. It should conduct the tumor. It's all one thing. Well, says the Gemara, there's a big difference. Hasam le mafsek, In your case of the olives, is, there's nothing, there's no barrier separating this uh, piece from the other piece. So if there's juice swimming around, it's all one big connector, it's one big concoction. Hacha mafsek yeshkoilas. Here, you have clusters. You have this one that he touched. You have the one next to it, which is a separate entity. So although there's some juice swimming around, it doesn't really matter. Because... As Mfarshim explained, in reality, the juice that's sitting on this cluster that he touched is really bottled to the cluster. It's not really considered juice. It's part of the fruit, so to speak. So technically, only that cluster gets affected. And uh, there's a chumra that the wine around it as well, but that's it. Not past that point. The next cluster is a new entity. Okay, so how do we pass? The Chachamim ruled to Rabbi Yirmiya, who encountered this type of situation. Va'amrila, some say to his son, the Vraid Rabbi Yirmiya. Kedibra Aymer, they followed the opinion of the Shita that says, Eshkol v'chol sirvi voice of Tmein. Only the actual cluster with the immediate surrounding is Tami. V'chol agas kulatoy, and the rest of the gas is safe and sound. Says the Mishnah. Okay, so until now we spoke about cleansing equipment, with respect to Yai Nesach concerns. Now, in the final, the last and final Mishnah of al that we're going to discuss a very common issue. Kashring. All types of uh, pots and pans and cutlery. They may have absorbed non-kosher residue, whether it's uh, non-kosher uh, food or uh, milk and meat mixtures, etc. How do we go about cleansing those, uh, those items? And we begin with a fellow who purchased something from a guy, which is presumed to be saturated with the non-kosher residue. He purchased a, a utensil, which is called clay tashmish, which means to say, it was used for food, right? It's a food-related piece of equipment. How do we go about cleansing it and kashering it? Something which only needs to be um, immersed in a mikvah. Because as we're going to see soon, there are two separate issues when purchasing a kli from a guy. If it's a used kli, one requires to kosher it. He has to go extract any embedded issue, any embedded residue. That's not kosher. But even if he purchased a brand new kli off the shelf in Walmart, there's a din of tvilas kalim. Right? The, uh, the Ran brings from the uh, Yerushalmi. The, the point is something which was used by a guy or something which is considered food equipment owned by a guy, it must go through some sort of like a, a conversion process. He says, he's like, he says, yeah, you have to be toilet to release it from the tumma of the guy and be machnisai be kedushas Yisrael, so that it enters, it, it gets elevated into the kedushas Yisrael, and now it's fit for you to use it at his meal. Beautiful Yerushalmi. So that's the second requirement. You have to kosher if there's any kosherous issues. But even if it's squeaky clean, never used. To be last, Caleb is required to. So one is sort of like a sormera, separated from the bad, or separate the bad from it. And then there's asay toiv, the po- more the positive element, to incorporate it into a higher sphere of a Yiddish uh, person's lifestyle. So that's the first thing, ashadarki lahatbul, something which was not used was hot, it wasn't a, a cooking utensil, it was a glass or something which is only used with cold. In this case, kashering is not required, hagol is not required. The most you need to do is to be toivalid in, in a mikvah, to give it the additional level of, of purity of tahara. So in this case, yadful, that's all you do. Be toivalid in, in the mikvah and use it. Lahagl, however, something which was used with hot, like a pot or something. So that requires hagol. Hagol means to spit out, right? To be magal, to spit out. Any embedded residue, yagil, have to go about with hagala. Lab and bor, something which 
requires libun, torching, because it was used over the fire, directly over the fire, so it, it absorbed the non-kosher element through uh, the, the, the burning, you know, fiery process. So that's why you extract it, right? Because you extract it using the same method as was used to embed it. That's what's called kibayloi, the same method employed in absorption of the material, kachpote, that's the same way. You're going to get it to spit it out, to extract it, to expel the embedded residue. So if it was used directly over the fire, ulav in bor, ulav in bor, you have to employ the same system, burn it over the fire. For instance, hashvudva askala, you have a spit. Askala is a, a grill. Used directly over the fire. Ulav in bor, the only way to make them kosher is to uh, tor- torch them down directly over the fire. So, <coughs> so we have basically we have three <coughs> levels. An item used only with coal, make sure it's clean and uh, put it in the mikvah. Used uh, with hot, like a pot, like a you know, stirring spoon, that requires hot gala, right? Dunk it into boiling water. If it was used directly over fire, direct fire is needed to make it kosher. And finally, we have something about a knife, hasakin. Although it was never used with hot, that's the case, right? So then, there's no need to make hagala, but a knife, by its very nature, since it employs pressure and, and, and you know pushing and and it forces the uh, the flavor or whatever into the um, upper surfaces of the knife itself. It's not just a, a little rinse will do it. You have to actually scrape it, shuffle. You have to scrape it tighter, and then you can use it. Tana will learn today, Brisa. Aside from hagala and kashering, every kli purchased from a guy, which is a food-related kli, the chulon tzrichan tefila bar bar misa. You have to table it in a mikvah forty saw, the standard mikvah. Uh, how do we know that's required? The Rava, the Makra, the pasuk speaks about the bnei Yisrael who got the um, food utensils from the goyim, from the midyanim during their uh, war. The pasuk says, "Kol davar sheyava beish." Anything which is Use over a fire, a pot, a pan, tavir beish. You have to actually um, run it through fire again. Okay, so uh, again, the point is keboiloi kachpoltoi. So, uh, like a spit, like a grill has to be torched down with a torch. But then the Pasuk adds a word, V'tahir. Now cleanse it. What does that mean? That's stage two. Hoysev l'cha hakos acharis. With this Pasuk, the Torah now adds another step in the process. Aside from removing the, uh, the bad, uh, you know, non-kosher residue, you have to take it to a mikvah to be matir, to be makadish that equipment. Tani bar kapara. Bar kapara has a price with another source. The fact that this pasuk uses the word nida is chata. Now nida is a term used in Parshas Chukas describing the paraduma waters. So I would think you have to uh, sprinkle the paraduma on every uh, fork that you get from the guy. Perhaps I would surmise. You have to sprinkle the paraduma water third and seventh day. Just like uh, somebody became tummy through a maze. Tamalayma no, ach. Ach, but may need Ach. Minimizes it. Chalak, chilek. So, no, no, we don't need that. So, then why does the Pasuk even say it? Why does the Pasuk refer to Menida? It's not referring to Paraduma water, rather, a mikvah. Mayim, the waters. Shanida, that a woman who's in Nida, Tavel's bed, immerses in them. Have a Aymer, we learn from Mer, by himself. A standard 40s uh, mikvah is required for tefillah's kalim as well. Now, why two sources for the Allah of tefillah's kalim? Both are needed. Itzrich le mikhtav v'tayr. We need the word v'tayr. And itzrich le mikhtav, we need that as well. Why? Because of rachmana v'tayr. If only the word v'tayr, I mean, I would say v'tayr kodu. Immerse it in just a little puddle of water. You don't need a mikvah. Because rachmana v'tayr, that's why I need, I need it to tell you. A full mikvah. Because Rahman of Nida, if the puzzle would only say Menida, 
Have Amina would say, well, Herev Shemesh Kanita. Then you need the uh, whole process, just like Anita. You need to immerse and wait for sunset, for nightfall, for the day to be over, for the purification process to be completed. Is that required? No. That's why Torah adds the word of Torah to tell you that Anita needs hair of Shemesh, but not Tvilas Kel. As soon as you table it, you can use it right away. Omram Nachman, Omram Avua, Afilu Kelim Chadashim Emashma. The requirement to be toivel, a clear purchase from a guy, applies to even brand new, never before used kalim, which have no kosher issues. How do I know? Because the Pasuk is speaking about torching these kalim that have non kosher material in them. And once you torch them, once you burn them out, you just renewed it. <coughs> even if you have a pre used kli. Velibnum, and you applied libun, right? Put it on a, you torched it until it got red hot, right? And you totally burnt it and cleansed it. At this point, there's no longer any conscious concerns. It's like a brand new kli. And still the Torah says, table it on a mikvah. Apparently, even a new kli needs that. But still, it needs to be immersed. Maskevla Rav Shesh, says Rav Shesh. If you're saying that even a new kli needs, so then, if the point of the tefillah is unrelated to the iser coming out, so then, even a, a, a wool shears, nami that also needs to be tevilled. So you buy a, a car in the store, you have to tevil it. Hamalei <laughs> says, no, no, no. Kli suuda, amurim beparsha. If you take a look at the the pas. Describing the, the kli of the guy that needs to be kosher and tevil, it speaks about a kalim which I used with hot. Called davash yavar beish. Says Rashi typically that refers to uh, food related equipment, which I used for cooking and roasting right, and baking, as opposed to a car, which typically is not uh, put on the fire. So therefore, it only applies to kli suuda food related equipment. Amar Nachman, Amar Avavor, furthermore, Loishonu, this tefillah is only a requirement, Elabla Kuchen, only on equipment, purchased from a guy. So now it's been transferred to Jewish ownership, you have to be tabled, as we explained before, to give it that status. Okay, Master Shahoya, as per the story in the Midbar, where they took the equipment from the guy for keeps. Avoshulin, but if you're merely borrowing, if you're going to you know, a hotel and you're drinking off their glasses, lie, that's okay, you don't have to be tabled. Rabbi Yitzhak Yosef Zavan, he purchased Mona de Marda. This um, piece of equipment used to, um, it's like a shovel, used to remove the um, bread off the oven. Um, and it was made of Marda, some cheap uh, material, animal waste, uh, earth, earth, mud, whatever. And he figured he had to be table. I had to table it because it was purchased from Avid Kacham Magai. Several at Vili figured he had to be table it. Amrle Homer Abana said this Chacham told him for Rav Yaakov Shemayin. His name was Rav Yaakov. The Dedim of Fashli. To me, it was explained. Many derech from Rav Yechanan. No, no, no. Kol ma klei matchis amurim be parsha. The parsha specifically refers to metal utensils. The pasuk lists gold, silver, copper, right? But uh, your uh, your thing, your apparatus doesn't doesn't really qualify. Amar Vashi, what about glass? Honey clays, chuches, these uh, glass kalim, are they compared to metal? Uh, in a way, hoyel of a Since when they break and shatter, yesh lehem takon, you can fix them up. You can remelt them and fix them up. Ki clay matchas damu. In this way, they uh, they're similar to the uh, metal kalim. And therefore, we treat them accordingly, and they have to be toivled with the rabbon. What about kunya? Kunya is a clay cheres, a clay, uh, you know, a dish, which is coated with metal, with uh, lead. So the question is, do we uh, treat it as a clay cheres, no tevila required, or as a metal clay, the, uh, since the actual surface is metal? There's a machlek, it's pligiba. Between Rav Ach and Rav Yin, Chadama wants to look at the initial kli, which is cheres, no tefillah required. Chadama Kesayif one says, look at the final product. 
the actual surface is metal. And you need to be toilet. If you look at it on the Allah's Kasaifa, we look at it as metal. Iboilo, now comes a new shayla. Mashkanta mai. What if he didn't borrow from the guy? He didn't purchase either. It was a collateral. He lent the guy money. He gave him a pot as a collateral. So the lender, the Jewish lender, has to look after it. But it's not really his. If he uses it, does he need to be uh, toilet? Omar Mar Barvashi. I'll tell you a story with my own father, Ravashi, Abba, my father, Mashkalev Kechom Kasa the Kasa, but this guy gave him a, a, a silver goblet as a Mashkan, but Atfalev Yishtebe, and he tabled it before he drank with him. Well, you done, I'm not sure why. Is it because he holds that a Mashkan is like a, a sale? Because, you know, for the time being, the lender is sort of the owner. And therefore, before use, you have to table it. Or perhaps, typically, you don't say that, except here, because my father mm, got the feeling that the guy is not coming back to redeem it. The Chazi, he, uh, he realized that this guy, the Dati Lishkuye, who plans on just leaving it by him, in which case, he's really like the owner, and therefore, he must toil before use. One purchases food utensils. From the goyim, minayit gechavim. So again, it depends what it is. The vorim shlin yishtamish ben things which he uh, never used, brand new. Then uh, only step two is required. Tvila matbilan vein turn. They're okay. However, the vorim shlin yishtamish ben aidet zayne things which he had used with coal. Could go in koises, vikatonis, sochias, glasses, tainers, uh, bowls. Madichan umadbilan. A proper rinse is required to make sure there's nothing sticking there, and matbilon you immerse in the mikveh tire and you can use it. Next level is dvarim shen shtamish pots, pans, things that we use with heat. Gona yoyres, hakom kumusin, hakom kumusin, machamim machamim, all types of pots. Magilon matbilon tire. In this case, you have to do hagola, put it into boiling water, and then be toivel, and you can use it. Fourth level is. Things used directly on dry heat and dry fire. Tvarim shen shtamish ben day ur, goin hashfudin, vatskaloyz, pits, grills, malabnon. The highest level of extraction is required by torching. Direct fire requires direct fire. Matbilan, then you do tefillah and turn, you can use them. Now suppose he, he took a non kosher pot and used it. Vichulon shen shtamish ben, achaloyat. He didn't do tefillah. He didn't do hagal. He didn't do what happens to the food that you cooked in that non kosher pot. Tani chada aser, v'tani dechmuter. So one brisa says that it's uh, it's aser. Okay, so the food that was cooked in this non kosher pot is is aser. And by the way, Tesis points out that um, uh, this wouldn't apply. It, you know, the first case was sh- uh, that he used it before Tvila, which means to say it was something originally only used with cold and that it required more than a Tvila. In this case, Tesis says certainly uh, all would agree that if it was used before Tvila, it's not going to affect the, the content. Tvila is a, a chiv, it's a mitzvah, but, but the evidence was used, the food um, in this uh, kli is not going to be affected. So the focal point here is on the other ones, the uh, the uh, pots, pans, uh, you know, things that we actually um, assume to have absorbed non-kosher material within them. Then he goes and uh, turns around and uses them without addressing the kashras concerns. According to one sheet, uh, it's asur. Tanya the other sheet says, but the if you use it after the fact, it's okay. How do we explain this machlekes? Uh, but just looking at Tesis again, he says that uh, if you if you miss the tefillah and you use it, it shouldn't really affect the content. But then he says, Mihu, he says, perhaps uh, you could say that it would be usur because otherwise he might go ahead and use real non-kosher pots as well. So perhaps uh, even just lacking uh, a tefillah would be a, an issue. Okay, in any case, we paskin, by the way, that... Uh, Although one is meant to be to table, uh, you know, new pots, but but the evidence if it was used, it's not going to affect the the content. So how do we explain this machlekes? Tani chad the aser, food is aser. V'tani idah the other sheet that says muta. How do you explain this? Like kasha, here goes the answer. 
Let's realize that any flavor embedded in the wall of this uh, of this kli, of this used pot, is spoiled, is stale. Right? Although it's nice and tam, it's going to impart flavor, it's going to contribute to the new dish you're cooking today, but it's going to be the fgam to its detriment. It's going to have a neg- negative effect. The old Eisen Gam is Asr. So we ignore the fact that it's stale and, 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 and spoiled. The fact is, it's time of Isr. So, but the ever, the food is Asr. Ha! The other opinion holds. Kamanda Omar, no Eisen Gam Mutter. Other sheet is following the sheet that says negative taste, bad flavor is Mutter. And therefore, the food in this pot is safe, is kosher. And in a minute, the one is going to ask, so then why even bother kosher? We'll get to that in a minute. Asks the Gemara, Ulaman do Omar, noisin tam lef kamut. If you say that the bad flavor doesn't affect the food, question is, Giuli oivdi kacham, the asa rachman. So why then did the Torah instruct us to kasha those pots taken from the Midianim back in the Midbar? What's the problem? Hechem ishkachasla, what's the problem? Why uh, kasha it? Omar rav chiyab reid rav huna, you're right. When the Torah for, forbade using that equipment before Kashmir, we're speaking about pasta that we used the same day, fresh flavor in them. Nothing stale about it. It's love. There's no use in Tamlafgam. But if it's already a day old, it's already the next day. According to somebody showing 24 hours later, according to Rashi overnight, whatever it is, it's been, it's been staled and, and, and soured and spoiled, then it'll be okay. But in this case, it was fresh. To love, no, you Tam Lav Gamu. Ask the Gemara the obvious question. Mikan ve'elach lishtri. Okay, so you have a pot. Last time used a week ago. Go use it without kashri. You're right. We're not Torah yet. We're We don't allow it because it can co- cause confusion. Now it's a week old. Next time you might use a day old pot. Gezerah is a concern of kadeira she'ene vasyem. If you allow them to use an old pot, mishum it might come to use gezerah vasyem a pot. Which was used today. But in theory, nice and of gum is mutter. And therefore, after the fact that the pot was used, the food is kosh. Now, the other opinion holds no. That nice and of gum is us. Vidach, the other sheet holds, kadeira basyema nami. Even if you insist that in, in the midbar, the pots were fresh pots. Even if it was used that day, even there, mifgam pagma, you have to agree that the, the flavor in the wall is somewhat tainted. When, when the flavor goes into the wall and comes back out, you know, the wall material certainly, um, you know, adversely impact <laughs> the flavor in there. Right? So it got nifgam through the wall, obviously. And when it comes back out, it certainly has a a certain degree of pagam to it. And still we see the Torah says it's us. Apparently this not of gam is us. Okay. So brief recap. We discussed the method of cleaning the uh, wine press equipment, water and afer, water and afer and afer and water, all different uh, sequences and opinions. We have the, um, the Bryce discussing various pieces of equipment and how to kasha them depending on their uh, on their makeup, a rinse, a nigov. In some cases, you have to wait 12 months. We discussed Yama yeah, to touch the, uh, the cluster of grapes. How far does the uh, tumor travel? And we discussed the, uh, the kalem, purchased from a guy. So first thing is the hagala requirement, the kasha requirement. It was only used with cold, no issue. With hot, you have to do hagala, directly on the fire. Dry fire, dry heat, you have to extract it likewise with dry heat. Um, and this was in addition to the Chiv Tvila. For any uh, clay suud, any food utensil purchased from a guy. And there were three conditions there. It has to be purchased, it has to be clay suda, and it's specific to clay mateches and glass as well. All the best to you and Atzlachara.